Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Next up, we're going to have Paul Shelston, and he's going to talk to us about Awaken Your Home, Python, and the Internet of Things. Give him applause. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Hello, everyone. Before I get started, just a quick show of hands. Who has heard here of Home Assistant? Okay, okay, that's cool. Who here in the room has a smart Internet of Things device in their house? Awesome, and of those people who live in a house, apartment, or do you actually live in a house, apartment, or room? In that case, pay attention, because this is going to be useful. Um, my name is Paulus Schoutse. I'm a software engineer for a company called Appfolio in San Diego. Um, but I'm here not to talk about my work today, I'm talking about my side project, Home Assistant, and how it can help you to automate your home. And so first, I want to talk about like, why does Home Assistant exist? Because we already have the Internet of Things, we already have apps, why would we need Python to like, manage this? And so the main reason this is, is that there is no standard yet that is widely adopted for home automation. And so every vendor who wants to go quick to market, doesn't want to like support some small standard, they are like, you know what, we'll just run our own cloud. We'll run our own protocol. And by doing so, they create an isolated environment where you know, your lights do not know about your thermostat. They do not know about your media player. And this goes one step further, is that you as a user end up with like an app per device type in your home. So you have one app to open to get your thermostat going, one for your lights. And this also results in when you want to do automation that crosses these boundaries, it's impossible because they don't know about each other. And so to solve this, there's this thing called a hub, a home automation hub. And so that is what Home Assistant is. And a hub bridges um, these devices by speaking all the different protocols that all these different devices speak. And so when we look at what the essence of a hub is, it's actually very simple. The first thing is it communicates with the Internet of Things, sending out commands. Thermostat, set your temperature. Light, turn on. Um, media player, start playing a movie. But the other piece that the uh, home, uh, home control part is, is that it gets information from the Internet of Things. And we can break up the information we get from the Internet of Things into two parts. The first part is state. And so there's devices, they have a state. At any point in time, you can look at a device and you can see its state. So for example, a light, its state is on, and there might be some extra attributes that explain the state of that device. So if the light is on, its brightness might be 60%, and the color might be red. If a media player is playing, the volume might be 80%, and it's playing a TV show called Game of Thrones. The other piece of information that we get from the Internet of Things is events. And events is not something you can just look by, you can observe by looking at like a device. You have to actually pay attention and then the event happens. So for example, a light is being turned on or motion is detected. And so this is like the foundation of a hub. This is how you as a user can control your home. And so the user will see the information from home control and can issue commands saying like, hey, why don't you turn the light on? Why don't you set the thermostat? But of course, this is also perfect to automate. If the user knows, oh, when I'm arriving home and the sun is down, I want the lights to turn on. That's home automation. And so home automation is rule-based. The triggers for home automation are always an event. So it cannot be when, when the light is on, trigger something, because it is uh, active over a longer period of time. But instead, you're going to have to look at when the light turns on. And so this is, for example, in the example I just gave, it is when a person arrives home. And so the next part is conditions. And so you, want not always, you don't always want your home automation rules to execute when this certain event happens. And so in the example I gave, only when the sun has set do you actually want to turn the lights on. And the last piece of home automation is to actually send a command. Let's turn the lights on. And so this combination of home control and home automation is what makes a home automation hub. And that is what Home Assistant is. And so Home Assistant is a home automation platform that's running on Python 3. It is open source, released under the MIT license, and it runs on tiny computers like your $35 Raspberry Pi. And the nice thing, because it is so easy accessible to get running, you host it locally, you know, for example, that your data will stay yours. 
there will be nobody looking at your data. And this is very important, because when you're doing home automation, your home automation hub knows everything about you. It knows like which room are you in, which lights are on, which, um, what are you playing, what's your favorite TV show. And the next thing what Home Assistant offers is that we allow you to track people and things on a map using like eye beacons or own tracks, which is an open source mobile phone application that talks directly to Home Assistant. And by this gives a whole extra dimension to home automation. Because all of a sudden you can say, hey, if I am arriving home and I'm within two kilometers of my home, why don't we make sure that the thermostat is uh, going to heat up my house? Or, hey, maybe when I'm at 7 p.m. and I'm still at work, let me get a notification and say, hey, go home. <laughs> uh, home Assistant comes with a responsive web application that you can run everywhere. So you can run it on your mobile phone, on your tablet, or on your browser. Another piece that is uh, very nice is that because we know the state of your home at current point in time, we are also keeping track of it. So you can go back in time as sort of like a time machine and say, well, how did my home look yesterday at 5 p.m.? Or, when did my kids arrive home last night? And the last piece is that right now, Home Assistant contains already 286 built-in components and platforms that integrate a lot of different services and devices. So, the Philips Hue bulbs, the Nest thermostats, the Ecobee thermostats, but also If This Then That, uh, the Amazon Echo, they all work with Home Assistant. And so, to see how Home Assistant actually maps to the Internet of Things, it's actually very simple. And it's a very almost like a one-on-one -on -one mapping about how I just described the essence of a hub. So the core of Home Assistant is an event bus. Any component, which are the pieces of code that you plug into Home Assistant, can fire, can fire any event, and they can listen to any event. The next piece is the state machine. And the state machine stores the state of so-called entities. I don't use the word device here, because we also track people, or like uptime of your computer. But the state machine, again, is very like open-minded. It doesn't force you to say, register how a light should be represented. It doesn't matter. It just holds the state, and it holds, uh, just holds the state and the entity and some extra data. And whenever the state changes, it will fire a state changed event. And so now, as your code wants to like listen for changes to states, it just, again, has to listen to the event bus. The next piece is the service registry. And so the service registry will allow components to register services that they want to make available to all the code that's on the event bus to allow calling to control devices, for example. So a light component will register, turn on a light. A switch will switch, toggle the switch uh, service. And so again, to call a service, you fire an event on the event bus. And then the service registry, once it has executed your event, will fire back hey, we actually executed your service. And so as a calling code, you know, OK, the work is done. And the last piece is the timer. So Home Assistant is an event-based system. And with an event-based system, it means the state of your application can only change based on the event. And so internally, this happens with a timer. And the timer will fire a time-changed event every second. And this will allow, for example, listeners to say, hey, notify me at 7 PM to know when to actually fire. Another way the internal state can change is with external events. So there are, for example, certain devices that allow to push their state directly to Home Assistant so we get notified. So now let's have a look how this actually works, right? Like how does it work to integrate an Internet of Things device into Home Assistant? And so let's say we have a light bulb. And so to integrate the light bulb, we have a light component. The light component in this case, the light bulb does not tell us about its state, so we have to poll for it. The light bulb, OK, what's your state? And we write it to the state machine. The state machine will do its job, fires a state changed event, and the light component will talk to the service registry to register the turn on command. Now let's say we have a motion detector in our house. And we want the motion detector to also integrate with Home Assistant. So we have a motion detector component. And whenever motion gets detected, it gets routed through the motion detector component, it pushes an event, and that component will translate that event to the event bus and fires a motion detected event. Now, we want to have some automation. And so, to get automation going, we would have 
a simple automation component that only what it does is it listens to the event bus, it listens for motion detected events, fires to the event bus, let's call the service, turn the light on, which gets routed to the service registry, gets routed to the light component, gets routed to our light bulb, our light bulb turns on. And all of this happens without the components knowing about each other's existence. Every component runs in isolation. Every component, um, it just only knows about its own things and it just exposes the interfaces that it wants to be, wants to have exposed. And so, um, there's one specific type of component uh, that we have, it's called entity components. And entity components in Home Assistant allow you to add support. And so the entity components sort of describe how Home Assistant expects a light to work, or like what we expect from a light, or what we expect from a thermostat. And so, on top of these entity components are platforms. So every integration we do with a device or a cloud is always represented as a platform that just follows the specifications of our entity component. And that way our entity component the abstracts the Home Assistant core away from the platform, so the platform doesn't actually have to know about the state machine, the service registry, anything. And so it does this with an abstract base class. And so this abstract base class consists of two parts. The first part is information that we want to know about this device. And some of this information is optional if you don't support it, otherwise some are mandatory. So for example, in the case of a light, is on, is very important, is mandatory for a light, because we have to know if the light is on or off. But the RGB color and the brightness are optional. Um, we don't, if your light doesn't support it, you don't implement it. And the next thing that you have to implement when you extend our abstract base class is the methods. So for a light, it's we want to be able to turn on, we want to be able to turn off. And by just implementing these two commands, you already have your own light. And to see how this, like, it's actually this simple. So I want to show an example, and this is, I'm going to show three examples. One of a sensor, one of a switch, and one of automation, and then I'm actually going to show how it looks in real life. So let's say we have a sensor platform. This is going to be a hard-coded sensor platform. So it will always return a static value. And all these code examples that I'm going to put here on the slides, and I hope it's readable, but I think it is, do actually work. They can be copied straight into Home Assistant without having to adjust any code. Um, on the left, is this, if you're just at home reading the slides again, uh, you would actually, how you would add it to your configuration, to your setup. And so when we start writing our sensor platform, the first thing we do is that we import our abstract base class. And then we implement it with our own, we extend that abstract base class. Then we want to give it a name. So we say temperature. We want to say the state of the sensor, which is 23. But of course, 23 doesn't mean anything. It could be Fahrenheit, it could be Celsius. So the last piece we have to expose is a unit of measurement. And so now, we only, the only thing left is how do we get this sensor into Home Assistant? And that's through a method. And this is like a method you define in your module. Home Assistant will automatically load your file, load your module, and call this method and so there are four parameters. First is the Home Assistant instance. The second is the configuration specific to your platform. Add devices is a function, a callback, that you can call at any point in time, even later, if you detect new types of your device. And discovery info is if your platform was actually automatically discovered instead of issued by a user configuration. And because this is hard-coded, the only thing we're going to do is that we're going to instantiate an instance of our example sensor. We put it in a list, because that's what the add devices uh, expects, and then we pass it to add devices. And then it, it looks like this in Home Assistant. We have our sensor. So now, let's go a bit deeper. Let's see how a switch looks. But I didn't want to do a hard-coded switch that just has an instance variable to control the state. I wanted to like, represent a real-life scenario, because in real life, home automation is not that easy. You know, you have your app to control your thermostat, but somebody might just walk to your thermostat and actually just change the temperature. And you have to be able to pick that up. You have to be able to control that. And so to sort of mimic this in the demo, I do it based on the existence of a file. So if the file exists, the switch is on. The file doesn't exist, the switch is off. If we turn on the switch, the file will get created. And if we turn off the switch, the file will be removed. And so we can actually now also go in the file system and remove that file, and Home Assistant will have to pick it up. 
And so the extra piece to make it more useful and re reusable, we allow it to be configured by a file path that you put in your configuration. Um, if you look at the bottom left, you see that we actually just inside the switch block in the configuration, we add file path and we add a path to a file. And so again, we first start by, implement, by importing and extending the abstract base class. And so by, uh, this will allow us, this, this time we actually focus on toggle entity as our abstract base class, which is the base is for a switch. And so we define a constructor because we want to actually focus on a specific file path that the user chose. Then we want to be able to test is the switch on or not. So we implement an update method. And this update method will just use the built-in OS module to see if the file exists on the machine. And this method will also be automatically called by Home Assistant periodically to make sure that Home Assistant has the latest representation of your switch. Then we're going to uh, add a name. The name is going to be the file name. So again, we use the built-in OS module. We want to expose if we are on or not. And so we will just expose the internal instance method, uh, yeah, ins sorry, instance variable that we stored in the update method. For turning on, we're doing the Python equivalent of the touch tool in Linux. So we open and close a, uh, a file right away, making sure it gets, exists. And for turn off, we remove the file. And so now again, the last piece is um, to add it to Home Assistant. And so again, we have a set a platform method. And this time, because we want to uh, wanna add the file path that the user su supplies, we just, the configuration, which is a dictionary, with the data that the user put in its uh, platform block, we get that data. So we can just reference config file path, and there we have the file path of the user. We add it to Home Assistant, and it will look, for example, like this. Here, we uh, observe hello and the file world, and hello is on and world is off. And so before I'm going to show this how this actually works, I want to show one more example, and this is the automation component, because this is the, the actual fun part, of course. And so this automation component is going to be very simple. It's like an XOR component, and it's going to keep two switches in opposite states. And so again, you create a file uh, in your configuration directory if you want to add this. Um, but this time in the, in the configuration section, you have to point it at the two names of your switches that you want to observe. And this, for example, would be a very simple one. Hey, if my air conditioning goes on, make sure that the fan to the outside is off, and vice versa. And so this is a component. This is not a platform. This is actually something that runs directly uh, on the Home Assistant core and has knowledge of this. And so it's a slightly different structure. So first, every component has to define its domain. In this case, it's XOR automation. The next piece is the setup method. The setup method is there's no uh, entity component abstraction around the platform, around this component. So this is the real, this is how Home Assistant loads its components. And so you get the Home Assistant instance and you get the whole configuration. So everything that the user supplied. In our case, we're just going to extract the two entities that we're going to observe. We're going to import some helpers that will allow us to test if an entity is on and toggle it. And toggle it means if it's on, return it off and vice versa. And so what we're going to do now is that the component wants to make sure when it gets started, we're already in a good place. So it's going to test, hey, is entity 1 equal to the state of entity 2? In that case, let's toggle entity 2 so it's in a reverse state. And then we're going to add a, we want to listen to state changes. So whenever entity 1 changes, we want to make sure that we can update entity 2 if necessary, and the same if entity 2 updates. And so Home Assistant allows for uh, state listeners. And so what you get passed in is the entity that changed the previous state and the new state that uh, it became. And so in our state change listener, it's very simple. We're going to first see what is the entity that changed, so we know what is the other entity that uh, we have to look at. We're then going to compare the two entities again. And if, one is not the same, if, one, if both are the same, we're going to again toggle the other one. Then we'll import a helper to register our state callback listener. And so you pass in your Home Assistant instance, you pass in the entities you want to observe, and you pass in your state callback listener. And by doing so, uh, this will actually listen for state changed events on the event bus, and it will actually already filter out all the state changed events that are not about the two entities we care about. So it's already like filtered down a lot. And the last piece 
is that you're going to return true to uh, show, to tell Home Assistant, hey, this component, it loaded successfully. And so now that we have an automation component and we have file switches, I have this uh, demo ready. And so this is Home Assistant. Um, I have two browsers open that are both pointing at the same uh, version of Home Assistant. Um, I have two switches. But one is pointed at hello, the other is pointed at world. And so now, if I'm going to turn the hello switch, the file hello will be deleted. Our automation will kick in, turn world on. And because world is being turned on, our world file will get created. So let's hope it works. There you go. <laughs> OK, thank you. And so <laughs> um, as you guys might have seen, the other interface actually updated too. And so have a, I'm going to click again on the left top interface, and the bottom, at the bottom right is going to update as well. And this is all instantly because every, the front end is connected to Home Assistant. It is connected to the same event bus that like, the rest of uh, the components are connected to. And because the front end can observe state changes as they come in, it can update the representation of, the whole, uh, of your home inside the browser and can immediately update this uh, in the browser for you to see. But of course, like I said before, we want a, a real case scenario. So now let's see if we, can, if we delete this file. Home Assistant, which is like trying to update the switches in the background periodically, will catch this. We'll, we delete the file, so hello will be turned off because the file doesn't exist. Our automation again will kick in and will create world. There you go. And so now you can see we can actually handle external state and we can handle internal commands. And so that's everything I wanted to show to you guys today. Um, if you like, want to try the interface on your phone right now, you can go to homeassistant.io slash demo. It should load fine. On your computer with Python 3, you can run pip3 install Home Assistant. It will install the core, and you can actually run the command line has dash dash open dash UI, and it will start the server. It will start your browser pointing at the server, and it will uh, figure things out right away. If you want more website, if you want more information or so tutorials, you can check out our website homeassistant.io. You can also stop by our community at community.homeassistant.io or very active uh, chat room if you run into any troubles. And also today at 5 p.m. we're having an open space at C122. So if you want to like get some help, help to get oh C120, okay C120. So if you want to like get started with it or like want to meet and greet some of the developers, because there are I think four of us right now at PyCon, um, that would be your chance. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? So, so hello, uh, we have about five minutes for questions. Um, he, there are two microphones over here. In the meanwhile, this is actually how Home Assistant looks if you have a full system. We can turn things off, you can like observe your media players, um, you can do a lot. What did you write the uh, uh, Android component in? Paulus. It's really um, nice. So it's not an Android component. It's actually a website, and it runs uh, Polymer web Perfect. components. Thanks. This is just a question. Check one, two. We good? OK, I think the mic is working now. Right? OK, uh, three really quick questions. First one, I noticed that the event bus kind of took a minute when you deleted hello and waiting for world to come up. Is that because of Watchdog or something, or will that happen if you flick a switch, that kind of thing? 
Um, because obviously flicking a switch, that'd be kind of a long time to wait for lighting. Uh, question number two, you were passing around an HASS object in there, but it wasn't clear what type that object was. So could you tell a little bit about that object? And also, would there ever be an occasion practically where you'd have more than one of those objects, or is it in effect a singleton? Question number three, is the home, the, the notion of the home <laughs> sort of hard-coded as a location? Because I'm working on living on a school bus, so is it possible that you could accommodate in your data model uh, a home that uh, moves? Um, well, I mean, okay, so the first one, the event bus, I forgot your question, but I'll go on to the second question. Uh, the delay, it took a second from hello, deleting hello to get world, remember? Uh, yeah, so it's... Um, well, so it's, it's instant like this, but it's not instant when you remove the file because it, it's not constantly watching the operating system because it's using our update method that we defined um, oh that we defined earlier in the example. But what if that were a light switch? If it was a light switch, it so it, it, it all depends on how fast your light can say, hey, I'm turned on or turned off, and so this depends per implementation. So for a bad light switch, we have to be optimistic, assuming our command succeeded. If it is a LIFX bulb, we actually get the state pushed to us. And for you, we just have to say, after we send the command, hey, did the command succeed? The second question was the, the has object, which is the Home Assistant uh, instance. And this is where you can interact with the service registry, the bus, and the state machine. And the third, a moving home would also be possible, um, because we can, like, uh, we don't right now have uh, for its home like a detection, but you could set up a dynamic uh, GPS that you set somewhere in your state machine. So it should be possible. Thank you. Uh, I might not have, I wasn't here the first talk. I was just wondering if you talked about what is the, what are you using for device-to-device -device communication in the back end and also between the hub and the web app? So we use, uh, for the web app currently uses event stream which is a HTML5 JavaScript uh, implementation to get all the events into the front end. And for device communication, it really depends on what the device supports. So for Philips U, we speak their protocol. Um, but so some, if there's an open, like uh, Z-Wave, for example, is a home automation standard. So then you have to plug in a USB stick that speaks Z-Wave into your computer. Home Assistant will connect to that and then can speak to the Z-Wave network in whatever language they use. Uh, I just had a question uh, that you just kind of answered. Is there, any, is there any recommendation or protocol of kind of compliance that devices should have that would work better for this, or just can, or each model, as I can see, can just implement the protocol for whatever device I get. So you just, we don't specify any protocol. You, we implement whatever the, the platforms implement any only the protocols that that one device is speaking. Because you know vendors are not making things to integrate with Home Assistant, but we want Home Assistant to integrate with vendors. I'm just yes. wondering uh, how you avoid some kind of recursion problem in, in the XOR uh, automation example, like when you change hello via the interface and your component changes world, what's to prevent you again responding to world changing and going? There, there's nothing preventing you. So a home assistant doesn't know how you're going to handle the event or what you're going to call next. Uh, that's all within your component. So if in my example, I wouldn't have to check if they are not, if they are the same it would indeed lead into recursion and the system crashes. Do you uh, integrate with OneWire devices? Sorry, which one? OneWire. OneWire. One wire. Yes. Um, yes, I think we have a OneWire sensor, but I'm not 100% sure. I do, OK. Yeah, we do. <laughs> Is it just a temperature sensor? Yes. OK. I heard. The expert is over there. So what's the recommended approach with, uh, for example, I have Arduinos and any moment in time I have an X number of sensors throughout my apartment. One right now is detecting when my downstairs neighbor starts smoking a cigarette and it alerts me. So I'd like to have a light in my hue turn red or a text or something. What's the recommended approach with So the your easiest own? way, if, like, so Arduinos, um, I think we have an Arduino um, USB protocol, so you can actually talk, if you connect it to a Raspberry Pi, it could talk to the Arduino. But a lot of people have switched to uh, the ESP8266, which mm -hmm. is a microcontroller which includes Wi-Fi, mm -hmm. and then you can just send either a REST call directly to Home Assistant, okay. but a lot of people actually use MQTT as a broker intermediate, MQTT. Okay. so that other things can also plug in easy. Thank you. Hi, I, I wanted to know about the Nest uh, integration. Because 
at some point I wanted to just um, uh, keep a, a log, a history of the temperature in, in the home using the Nest as a, as a you know, uh, measuring device. And, yeah. and Nest makes it very hard because you have to go through their API certification process and so on. So I was wondering if... So that will, we have a Nest component that integrates Nest. And we record all the temperatures. So this is something you can get for free ah, if you would, uh, use. And you can also then, you don't only have to keep it in Home Assistant. We have certain pro, um, components that actually export it to like Grafana and Splunk. So you can have it like in analytics engines. Cool. Thanks. I'm sorry. This is all we have time for questions. If you have an further questions, you can talk to the speaker directly. Yeah. Or Give him a hand again. At 5 p.m. <laughs>